Hi everyone, welcome to a video here that should Im include when we're done some live footage of some machine operations working in alfalfa. I've titled my talk Cultivating Alfalfa. It's basically a, a long overdue explanation of why and how and the therefores and wherefores of helping to support this uh, very valuable perennial crop. And I guess I should probably also suggest that the use of this particular process in alfalfa is not exclusive to alfalfa. It really applies to many different perennials from woody species uh, to um, uh, grasses and, and other legumes. So um, with that very brief introduction, let's uh, get me in the corner here and let's see if we can't move forward in uh, looking into the whys and wherefores. First of all, though, I want to introduce uh, the persons uh, who are really responsible for the fact that I have anything really to talk about at all, and that's Peter Bannon and Alan Young, both from down under in New Zealand. Peter is the dairy farmer who essentially pioneered the design of the tine, which um, is being preserved today in uh, the Smart Till machine and in the Curse Buster. And Alan Young is the man who actually brought Peter Bannon's vision forward and actually produced the machine, which is still in production today, called the Groundhog. Thank you to both of you gentlemen for your faithful discharge of a vision that Peter had for preserving his pastures. The other gentleman I want to introduce you to, and especially here on the left, is Carmen Wepler. Uh, Carmen uh, embraced this technology about three years ago now, and uh, this is a picture of him in 2014, uh, taking his first look at the kind of root systems that he developed in his first year of corn following some alfalfa that had been in production for several years. Um, Michael Freisleben is with him here, assisting on the field day as we looked at these root systems and examined the health of these corn plants. Carmen was is host of the uh, 2016 Forage Council uh, Hay Expo field day, and um, I'll be joining him, and we'll have presumably some video segments from that field day if all technologically goes well. Well, to start out with, let's just assume that uh, everyone understands that uh, there's a lot of water on the planet um, and that water in its uh, best days is a tremendous blessing when it's lacking from the ecosystem that we're trying to farm with or when it's in too great an abundance, it is a real serious problem. And um, the fact that scripture talks about water a great deal um, has always been a source of encouragement to me to keep my focus on where's the water and how's it behaving and what is it affecting. Certainly the injunction in Genesis 8.21 and the pronouncement of a curse at the rearranging of the hydrologic cycle has been a, a, a hallmark of uh, all of what I've had to say for many, many years now. Uh, and the primary reason that has been such a preoccupation is because we, certainly I do, I recognize, and I think you do too, that it has a profound effect on how much air is contained in our soil. Most experts today have agreed for many, many years that a healthy soil will consist of approximately 50% void spaces that are filled with air. Well, that is, of course, a master designer's program for healthy soil and plants. And um, when water does not behave correctly, or structurally soil cannot accommodate those voids, or they just don't exist, then we're going to begin to contain less than the desirable amount of air in the soil atmosphere. And everyone pretty well agrees with that. The thing we're now discovering is that um, there's a very clear association between the amount of tillage that we do and whether or not a soil is more bacterial or fungal. And generally, everyone agrees that when you do conventional or minimum tillage, which winds up incorporating forcibly higher volumes of air into soil than normal, uh, you drive the system toward bacterial to the elimination of fungal colonies. Similarly, 
when you uh, stop tilling, uh, conversely, you develop a fungal predominance in the soil system. Uh, of course, now, <laughs> most of us, when we talk about fungi, we think about the bad guys. And uh, that, in fact, is what happens if water management and air management um, fall out of bed and we wind up with water logging anaerobic soil conditions. We can also get the same thing in bacterial worlds. We have some pathogenic gram-negative bacteria, which are also pathogens to plants. And so it can happen both in the fungal world and the bacterial world that um, you get this happening in an anaerobic condition. And um, unfortunately, the track record does seem to indicate that the fungal colonization in the no-till environment does tend to run toward pathogenic. And that certainly has been verified in a lot of the lower rainfall areas of the Western Plains and the High Plains of North America, and around the world for that matter. So I would like us to take a look at tillage, or if you will, cultivation, in terms of what does it really got to do for us? What does it really, how does it work? And I'm, I'm going to offer to you that its primary function should be to restore normal air and water exchange. We actually do see this as a direct result of performing tillage, um, certainly in terms of water movement in the plow layer itself. Deeper than that, of course, if there are silt layers or compaction layers created through the performance of actual tillage itself, well then, of course, we only have, you know, uh, water percolation capabilities to the point where we've compacted the soil. But at any rate, I think we, if we got, were to get our shovel out in this field right here, for example, we would find out that we actually have a very dry soil, or certainly not anywhere as near field capacity in this soil. With a shovel, we'd find out that we only have really water here sitting in about the top three and a half to four inches. Uh, we think it's a wheel track compaction issue because that's where the water appears. But that's only because the surface of the soil has been depressed so that the water shows up. If you actually go out in this field and shovel between where there's no water showing, you'll find the water level is exactly the same as it is in the wheel track areas. So this tells us there's some kind of a barrier, and the barrier is not a plow pan characteristically at 9 to 11 inches deep in the soil. It's somewhere up in the plow layer where this field is experiencing air and water exchange issues. And of course that brings me to the story which got me really on this track and really started helping me redefine what tillage in effect should be doing and, and it doesn't require a lot of things that we think tillage does in order to be accomplished. It's the story of Donnie Holman that many of you may have heard before or have read about in other PowerPoints on our Soil Curse Buster website. But Donnie had called me in frustration after watching water sit on low spots in his alfalfa field for four days. The field was only down less than two years, and he had ripped it and never disked it and never used a sweep, never did anything to compact the top of this field in any way, shape, or form. Used a brilliant seeder and his 40-20 to seed it, and... This is what happened when he lost three feet of snow, collected three or four inches of rainfall in the middle of February in northern New York. And as you can see, Donnie has been running through there with a groundhog, which was actually brought to me out of a container from New Zealand in the summer of 1983. This is uh, 1984. Uh, that's a little closer look. You can see where the water line was covering this area. By the time I got my camera focused and finished riding up and down the field with Donnie three times or so and got the camera out, um, that's how much the water had receded. And uh, we got so excited, we even planted a flag and somehow thinking maybe we would be able to calculate how many gallons of water was in there and how fast it was disappearing. Uh, our math skills and other commitments never gave us the uh, privilege of doing that. I think it would have been a very interesting number. Um, I thought Donnie was crazy. He told me he thought it would work. And in fact, it really did. It worked very well. What we had done essentially was restore air and water exchange. What I've diagrammed here is 
air movement with yellow lines and water movement with blue lines. And in this field, above where the normal plow layer would be, at 7 to 8 inches, there had been a concentration of silt particles which had slowed the water movement and blocked air underneath so that water began to appear on the surface. And over time, any of you who've grown alfalfa or farmed no-till for any amount of time, you've seen these low areas in your fields become more problematic. That's why in the Midwest today, in a wet harvest in soybeans, you'll see patches in low areas of soybean fields left for one to two weeks after a rain event because they want to plant no-till corn next year and they don't want to rut those bean fields up with the combine or the grain cart. When Donnie stopped at uh, going through this field, we saw these bubbles of air. I first frankly didn't even see them. Donnie had to tell me, look for them. And you'll see here one uh, on the right side of the arrow and on the other side you'll see the wakes from when the bubble burst, uh, still uh, moving across the surface of the water. That meant air was coming up out of that soil which meant that air had to somehow have been introduced into the soil. And that, in fact, is the normal procedure when water enters soil. Air is purged, and then fresh air follows in behind the water due to partial pressure, and we get exchanges of high CO2 air for high oxygen air content, uh, high nitrogen for low nitrogen. So, essentially, the soil gets to breathe, and the good guys love it. The proof and the evidence of that is really great here in this picture because um, all of you who've worked with um, animal waste, uh, certainly dairy waste, and agitated it have seen these foams that form on top as water and air trap the air and produce this light beige color. This was taken at the Forage Research Farm in 2003 in Prairie du Sac, Wisconsin, where we dumped 8,000 gallons at the top of this little hill here from two trucks. You see one of them in the picture. Um, that is essentially, um, let me see if I can get myself out of here. Well, I guess I'm out of there. Um, uh, as the air came up through the liquid that was entering the soil where we had run the uh, Bannon groundhog tine system 75 feet on the face of that slope, you can see the, the evidence of where the liquid is going in because of the white foam that was appearing on the surface. So here's what happened as a result of the experience at Donnie Holman's farm. I decided to take uh, mechanical assays of the soil system to determine what the percentages were of sand, silt, and clay for every inch of soil. And you'll see the percentages portrayed there in the upper left and the bar graph that results from that display. The purple band is the silt percentage, and you can see how that percentage varies. Of course, the others vary in, in, court, in, in uh, relationship to it. What we essentially did was poke a hole through that silt. The crop emerged from the water, standing water. You'll see the flag there. This is what first cutting looked like. And um, this is what the tine actually did in the soil as we went through the water. It created these stress cracks that you see in the compression wall where the tine moves laterally. It also created vertical stress cracks which are invisible to the naked eye, but root systems reveal to you very quickly as they grow in that system um, underneath where we call it the tine skid. And uh, because of the speed of the shaft, you'll see the insertion over the top of the hole was actually all over a foot in length. This is, this, is the, this is the incredible mystery of the design which Peter Bannon created back there in the mid-70s. Here's basically what happens. The soil over time is uh, accumulating this density layer through silt that moves with water down through the profile. And what we did, in a sense, uh, was to break the barrier. We just essentially fractured that zone. We allowed water and air to exchange, air trapped underneath, as evidenced by the bubbles on top of the water emerging. And so um, we had effectively um, restored air to the, uh, the field where we had been basically 100% saturated. Now, um, 
the uh, two charts you see in front of you here uh, are actually repeats. The one in the background on the green bars is a reproduction of the soil that was uh, aerated or cultivated, if you will, um, and the percentages and how they had uh, changed over a period of about three months from the time it was done until the soil was actually sampled. The data was collected on July the 15th or so in 1984. The field was actually cultivated through the water in February, uh, the day before Valentine's. The bars in the front are from a check area within the field, showing you the difference in the percentages of silt between where the machine was operated and where it was not. The untilled check basically continued to be anaerobic in the top when it rained, but because it was not low ground where the water would accumulate, it never uh, seriously impacted the air and water relationships, but it did essentially provide a floor over which the water would then migrate downslope to the lower areas where the same physical condition existed. Now, the impact of all this. Um, research was done here, uh, reported in uh, Ellis and others' work in 1977, uh, published in Plant Root Systems. Um, what we have here is an annual which will show you some of the, most all of the same effects of any perennial that's annually having to regrow its own root mass. I probably should state a fundamental truth here is that a perennial is an annual, just gets another crack at living another year at, by reproducing its root mass. So it faces identical challenges, really, of an annual. So we're looking at a barley root here, but we're really looking at the reinitiation of a root mass of a legume or a perennial simultaneously, especially one that would reroot like a grass in the springtime when it breaks dormancy. With 82 millimeters in the previous month, you can see the top, the lighter colored bars, almost 75% of the total root mass was developed in the top five inches of the farm. And uh, where the rainfall was only 24 millimeters in the previous month, it was somewhat less than 43%. So a massive difference in the amount of root mass developed in the top of a field. Interestingly, when you look at long-term or short-term no-till crops, like this corn plant, you see this huge concentration of dry matter and root mass in the top portion of the plow layer, usually confined to about three to four inches of soil. Very characteristic. So whatever was going on with that barley with a high rainfall period is happening here. And so my point is that essentially any time we stop tillage and we still continue to get precipitation or irrigation water added, we accumulate this silt density layer and it has a profound effect. In corn, because like in other plants, the root systems only expand, only at lengthen for about three days, um, you see this high concentration. They have a problem getting through the barrier. They're living in potentially an anaerobic environment, or certainly in the fruits of an anaerobic environment, which may have existed prior to the date you planted it. Hopefully, you're not planting it in mud. And so it is you have all these stages of root development and plant development that really hinge on root system development, setting the clock and setting the conditions for the next stage of, of yield enhancement growth. Here's another idea on how this is being affected. Um, in this case, looking at a material called ethylene. Ethylene is a naturally produced in anaerobic soil growth regulator. You all know it works because you see the short crops and the wet spots on your fields. And the reason that is, is because the ethylene has the ability to shorten the cell wall, uh, the stems of your plants, so you create this shorter plant. Well, here's here is a barley plant grown in aquaculture that uh, received an inoculation of 10 parts per million of ethylene. Uh, it got it for a period of 13 days from 9 to 22 days after germination. And you can see from the first arrow where the, in, the injection of the ethylene was performed to the second arrow, the difference between the plant, which was the check or control, it received none, and the plant which did. The 
plant on the right, of course, the one which received the ethylene treatment. You can see how it intensified the rooting activity uh, above the point in time where the uh, ethylene was introduced and how it changed the root system development from deepening and going downward to going laterally. A totally different appearing root system under the influence of ethylene. And again, to repeat, ethylene is a direct result of an anaerobic soil condition. All right, now let's see if we can take some of these basics and apply them to an alfalfa plant or other legume which needs to be able to regenerate its root mass on an annual basis. Um, what we have here is research from the 1950s done at the University of Wisconsin and uh, it shows you um, in a greenhouse experiment where plant sizes and reproductive stages could be very carefully controlled and regulated and plants uh, removed that uh, were not uh, on schedule or out of sync with other plants in the groups. What we have here is on the chart the harvesting dates at the bottom and the dry weight of the roots of 50 plants up the left side. And what's happening here is that the researcher, who I believe is named Smith, actually developed uh, a cutting regime at different points in the life of the plant and then measured the root mass. You can see the bottom line. Every time the plant was cut in the vegetative stage is recorded with a round circle. So there are, I think, of seven cutting intervals there. Yes, ranging from the 25th of April to the middle of November. The increase in dry matter root mass um, increased very slightly in August, but by the end of uh, the last cutting in November 16th, plants subjected to this kind of cutting regime actually lost in their total dry uh, mass uh, from 50 roots. The second line, if um, we look at this one and see how, whether or not this plant's been able to replace its root mass, looks much better. It doesn't look really good for a long time, but by the time you get into July, by cutting in late bud stage, still no flowers apparent on these plants, uh, you've got uh, some increase. And by the time you get to mid-November, the plant has actually been able to create um, a replacement amount of dry mass. I translate that into meaning that there are replacement root systems that have been able to grow and essentially recreate the original root mass. Remember, these roots are going to fill with extraneous minerals like iron and aluminum and various other things. Insects are going to probably nibble away on some of them. And they're basically going to wear out or rust out or one way or another become dysfunctional. So for this plant to survive from year to year, it has got to be able to replace root mass on an annual basis. That basically is the upshot of this slide, realizing that cutting regime has a tremendous amount to do with the ability of the plant to replace its root mass. It is the trigger event, if you will. Here's late blood, late bud, excuse me. Okay, now the full bloom, uh, that's the empty triangles. Only cut three times in the year. None of you would probably even be tempted to do that in most of the continental United States or Europe or any place else. You need to get more feed quality out of this plant than what that's going to give you. But you can see what happens when, when you see flowers, right? Uh, that first cutting, you've got almost triple the amount of root mass you had when you started with these plants. And by the end of the season, you are at a solid 90 grams for 50 roots, literally three times the original root mass. So you've been able to increase root mass by essentially equal to the amount that you had when you started. So this plant is bigger, stronger, and healthier than it's ever been. And you've all seen those in your neighborhood, haven't you? Where somebody doesn't cut his alfalfa only twice a year, and you've seen him cutting it for 35 years, and you try to figure out how can he make his alfalfa last so long, and you cut yours four times, and Gee, three years and it's dead, it's gone, it's not worth keeping it. By the fourth year, you plow it up or kill it or do something, but it's not worth mowing again and dandelions have taken over. What is the difference here? Well, 
I posit for your consideration that it has to do with the fact that he's producing massive root replacement activity every time he uh, grows that crop. Of course, the uh, big coarse dotted line with the solid triangles was never harvested. And they documented by pulling plants and measuring the root masses what was going on there. Of course, the plant was flowering and it was regrowing. So it was actually increasing and decreasing in dry matter content of root mass according to the requirements to produce itself again from crown shoots. Well, to me, this was a real... But when I found this chart, this really helped explain a lot of things to me. And when you look at a stand, I, I, because of the, the understanding that we, ga we gained from this piece of research so long ago, I, I got a couple of questions that, that, of course, came to mind. I started looking at things a little differently. I said, well, what exactly now does it mean when we cut alfalfa at the recommended 10% uh, bud or 10% bloom stage? Um, First of all, are those the same? Well, according to this research, no, they're not the same. There are some very different things that are going to happen when you're at bud stage and you're cutting versus being at bloom. Well, okay, that's good. Now, number relating to that first question, though, what does it mean, really, when you talk about we're going to cut at 10% bloom? Where's everybody? Where's the other 90%? They haven't, yeah, that's right, they haven't attained to the bloom yet, have they? So what does that mean in terms of rooting activity? We got about 10% of the stand, which has been able to perhaps, all conditions being equal to the greenhouse in Wisconsin, they've been able to triple their dry matter in root mass. Massive increase. But what about the rest of the plants, the other 90%? Uh, we have no such guarantee, do we? If they're at late bud, or if they're at mid or early bud, or if they haven't even gotten to the bud stage yet, oh my goodness. What we've effectively done with our mowing machine and our recommendation for cutting at 10% bloom is to say we don't care about the other 90%, whether they grow root masses under them or not. And I think that's really not a great idea because it could very well be that that's the reason we have so much mortality at two and three and four years down the road. And these stands, which start out with as many as 24 plants per square foot, wind up at less than three or four. And you decide with the dandelion pressure and everything else, it's time to terminate the stand. So my point, I think, is that soil systems age. And when they do, if you put all of these pieces together, and you realize the plant is going to be responding to soil conditions and to cutting regimes, that we have a situation here that is absolutely going to be the death of the stand. Number one, I'd like you to look at the crown development on this mature stand. You can tell it's mature because look at the size of those tap roots. They're good size. But look at the crowns. Just like two shoots, maybe three, there's almost... I mean, you call it a crown because it's the top of the plant, but that's about all you can say about it. There's not much there. We know that the fertility has probably been applied either from uh, commercial fertilizers or manures or something, and that's concentrating up here. If you've ever done any top two or three inch soil testing in alfalfa stands at the conclusions, you'll find out you have a massive accumulation of phosphorus and potash up here. And we also know because we now understand about how this silt layer forms, that it's had three, maybe four years in this case here, looking at these plants, to actually develop this anaerobic zone. And look at the evidence. There's virtually no lateral feed root mass above that zone of three to four inches under the surface where this silt most often accumulates. Our feeder root mass in our, or our mouth parts, our laterals, are actually all developed underneath this layer, which has been basically blocked, it has very, very poor air and water exchange. Amazingly, this plant actually does appear to perhaps have some nodules in that center plant underneath that system. How they got there and how they're prospering, well, probably not very well. So, uh, basically, what we have here over time 
without any intervention is a very typical no-till environment where we have aggravated anaerobic soil conditions, nutrient concentrations on the surface, and if root systems can get through the, the obstructive layer of closed pores uh, due to silt mobility, uh, we have basically two worlds. The one that has, uh, in this case, uh, mouth parts, and one where we have nutrient concentrations. And these two worlds never get together. And uh, they finally spell doom to the stand and we terminate them. Uh, this is uh, actually a multi-species stand of hay being uh, cultivated in the fall. It's got about 8 to 10 inches of growth on it. It'll bounce right back. It's not damaged in any way. There's no soil up in the system. These folks cut this hay for a, a beef cattle and um, this is uh, getting serious amount of age on it and shows no evidence of decline whatsoever. In the fall, when this alfalfa that's in here and the other legumes that will regenerate root mass when the plants go dormant in the fall, will actually put out additional root mass in this cultivated or loosened soil environment with all those horizontal stress cracks and vertical stress cracks under the tip of the tine that we saw earlier in the presentation. One of the things that's going to happen when we do this process is we're going to restore a very friendly environment to foraging insects where they can lay their eggs and hatch their young and they don't have to worry about being drowned. And when we do that, we see massive increases in the rate of recycling of cellulosic and lignified plant material that we leave on top of our fields whether it's the alfalfa stand in the fall that never got harvested or whether it's corn stalks like portrayed here, we've documented that in the case of this corn, for example, by just influencing the uh, predation from foraging insects, we've been able to reduce uh, not only the character but the volume of the soil or of the plant material that's been left behind. These are the guys that do it. This is a picture of an upside down microarthropod and um, when we cultivate these perennial crops and we maintain air and water exchange we basically provide food and proper shelter so that these very beneficial organisms like the beetles, uh, manure, dung beetles, earthworms and others sorry about that spelling of earthworms my goodness um, that's how these, these animals will uh, reproduce and grow and intensify in their presence. Now this, of course, is a curse buster. You're uh, looking at a 30-footer that runs in uh, central northern uh, Indiana. Here it's operating in wheat stubble. It's actually getting canola seed incorporated. Uh, it's doing it without mixing the entire plow layer. It's perforating the zone of silt accumulation. Uh, it's going to improve dramatically infiltration at the surface. And the wheat straw left on the surface is going to protect that surface from the hammering effects of rainfall. Uh, percolation internally is going to be improved because we've addressed that density layer of silt that's blocking the air and water exchange in the plow layer. It's actually removing small emerging weeds right now with the rotary harrow attachment and incorporating some ammonium sulfate for starter in on the canola and some needed sulfur. Uh, Dan Burst from Wisconsin has gotten some really good things going at his dairy. He's actually uh, tilling his fields plow layer deep in the spring. He's using his air package here to apply uh, cover crop seeds and um, weeding with his rotary harrows and pulling his corn planter directly behind this 15-foot machine. Uh, all in one pass with no chemicals, he's establishing his cover crop and his main crop simultaneously and it's been working for him very very well. Now, this is a bit of an example that goes back a few years to showing you the impact of cultivation on a perennial like alfalfa when you want to plant the succession crop in this case corn. Yes, if you look underneath there you'll see those are blooming alfalfa plants. And uh, I'll tell you the sequence here. The stand was uh, three years old and in November 
half of the field was actually um, uh, cultivated one time in the direction of these cornrows. And then in the springtime, the hay was harvested on the whole field. To the right side of the slide is where the machine was not operated. To the left is where it was. And if you look carefully, you'll see there's a difference in the color of the plants on the right side in the upper right-hand corner compared to the left. And um, then when the corn was about four inches tall on a hot sunny afternoon, uh, Harold came through here with the same machine and um, essentially cultivated the corn and the alfalfa, which were at about the same height, four to five inches. And um, this is what a close-up looked like in the base. The alfalfa was really very good. Lots of material there. Okay, why aren't we advancing to our next slide? Now oh, I see. This will help. All right. Oops, back up again. <laughs> oh, my. We skipped right over one that was really, really important. Oh, well. How am I going to get back there? Okay, just needed a little time to think. All right, uh, here is the right side of the field. If you look to the left at the very top of the slide, you'll start to see those other taller, greener corn plants where the cultivation was performed in the fall and spring. This side of the field had all the same treatment except it lacked tillage. I personally don't recommend just trying to start the cultivation of the legume in the fall before you want to plant the corn. I'd much rather see you doing it much earlier in the life expectant or in the, in the life of the alfalfa stand. It helps to maintain the uniformity of the blooming and flowering and reproductive stages of the plant, controlling weeds and all kinds of other good stuff. And basically, it makes a huge difference in terms of the performance of a corn crop behind it, whether you leave the alfalfa living or not. And frankly, there was no problem in coming to yield on the side that had the tillage. This side of the field, the corn stalks, unfortunately I have no follow-up photos. There was, the corn stalks were very slender. They, they did not have uh, good lignification. They were tall and very skinny and there was a rain event with some high winds and it essentially lodged this whole side of the field and the other side stood. So making the comparison for grain, which was the goal here, basically went out the door and it was all taken for silage. But uh, big difference in terms of the silage content that was taken off. You dairy farmers listening to this, you can imagine the quality of the feed that came off of here with all of that alfalfa being harvested with the corn. Now, the reason that most people don't think this can ever possibly work is because the way down deep they know that you can't grow two competing products. You're going to run out of water or light or something. And uh, this chart, which I actually um, received from Al Trouse, formerly and now retired uh, from the National Soils Tillage Lab, uh, shows the uh, water usage rates uh, to produce a pound of dry matter. You can see the number of pounds of water here. For alfalfa, it's 858 pounds of water to produce just one pound of dry matter. So if you're harvesting uh, up in that six ton range, 12,000 pounds, you can multiply that times 12,000 and figure out how many pounds of water divided by 8.34, and you know how many gallons of water and acre inches of rainfall you've had to have to grow that crop. It's massive. Compare this to corn at 372. My goodness, it's a fraction of it. But put those two together in the field and you're going to have a disaster. I'm sure you're persuaded to that. Well, what's interesting here is that um, it doesn't happen that way. The alfalfa is actually transpiring 858 pounds of water into the air. Corn, according to Iowa State, 30 years ago is able to extract up to 80% of its total water requirement from the air. Wait a minute. Are you telling me I'm creating humidity 
from the alfalfa growing in the understory, and the corn is able to suck it out of the air to the tune of 80% of what it needs. Yes, I guess that's what I'm saying. So, is the alfalfa actually competing for moisture with the corn? Doesn't seem like it, does it? It's actually also serving the very valuable function of transpiring CO2 12 hours out of every day. And there is probably nothing other than water, perhaps CO2 is even a greater requirement than water, for corn. That corn just is going to gobble that CO2 up. It is much to its benefit to have that CO2. The other thing that was a part of this sequence, which is very important for success, is what happens with the second cultivation through the standing, growing, actively growing corn and alfalfa. And that is that you're going to impact the growth and reproduction of Nitrosomonas and Nitrobacter. Those two organisms are basically converting ammonium nitrogen forms in soil to nitrate forms. And the corn responds very positively early in life to increases in nitrate nitrogen. It, it, we know what happens when you put it on. It grows. It grows very well. And it needs that amount of nitrogen to do that. The alfalfa, by comparison, has a primary need for ammonium nitrogen, the NH4 form, to feed nodules. So when we essentially cultivate, we are robbing food sources from the alfalfa and giving it to the corn. And this basically what's, is what turns the table in terms of the shading effect of the alfalfa on the corn. In the absence of this second pass, timely, we find many times on occasion that the corn is unable to successfully compete with the height requirement, of the, or the height achieved by the alfalfa. We certainly saw that happening on Harold's place where he did no cultivation, so the corn struggled in terms of uh, getting nitrate nitrogen, and it struggled in terms of probably developing a normal root system. Okay, let's see what we can do to get us to advance. All right, here we go. Now, this is the actual time that was designed by Peter Bannon. I wanted to show you this because I want you to understand that not all of these devices that are built like this actually can perform the same functions that we've been talking about so far in our talk here. The secret to this tine is the fact that it reduces the speed of the shaft and creates that elongated top that you see where the tine is penetrated in the soil. It produces very low turning torque and therefore the shaft turns more slowly in direct response. As a result, of course, the tip of the tine is dragging in the bottom of the hole that it's formed and it creates these vertical stress cracks as the sense of weight is being removed through the dragging action of the tine. The density layer, which exists somewhere in the length of that tine, is at least partially destroyed so that there are locations, approximately 43,000 of them per acre, where now air and water can exchange and high CO2 soil is purged and is replaced with uh, low CO2 air. Uh, low nitrogen air also is exchanged when water comes or the water table rises, either one. And essentially when it, this water table drops or the water moves on through, it pulls in fresh high concentrations of nitrogen and oxygen to fuel the beneficial microbes that are existing in that soil. As proof of this really uh, almost invisible action of the time in its uh, performance, we found this on a farm who's been running our machines for these tines for about 10 years. This is a John Deere ripper shank installed as a retrofit on a DMI frame. And you can see the wear pattern on this uh, replaceable shin piece on this John Deere shank down about eight inches from the surface where the tip of that tine has been running for uh, over a decade now, you can see the lack of wear. Essentially, there is no wear. That ta shin piece, if you drop a line straight down from uh, Wayne's finger down to where the shin piece sits in the replacement point itself, you can see that it is the original depth 
there's more compaction being addressed in the top four inches of the field and under where the tine has been running than there is in the zone where the tip has been sliding and creating those vertical stress cracks. Here, for example, is a typical wear pattern on a ripper shank. In fact, the density layer being so intact has worn out even the side of the shank and that's why you see that patch being installed. Well, let's talk about tillage then as a management tool and uh, now and keeping in mind while we do that that um, we're really talking about um, its impact on a perennial uh, in terms of its needs for uh, weed control, for air and water management, and so forth. First of all, we want to be able to move precipitation or irrigation water into the field quickly off the surface through infiltration. Yes, hopefully earthworm activity and other things are going to help, but we know that every time this tine enters and creates these fracture forces around the hole, we're definitely going to improve infiltration. And we want this uniformly across the whole surface of the field. We want to store off of the whole acreage additional water. We want to do it through efficient percolation down through the plow layer into the deeper reaches of the water, uh, the, the, the water table. Number one, uh, that's number one. And number two, we want to be able to enhance wind and water erosion control. Certainly by getting infiltration and percolation combining efforts, we're going to reduce the amount of runoff that occurs. And of course, by leaving root systems intact and preserving any mulches that are on the surface, we're going to reduce wind erosion. And surprisingly enough, um, uh, people who have been concerned about wind movement of this residue left on the surface have been delightfully surprised in places like Nebraska and um, realizing that the base of the corn is actually still sitting there above the ground after tillage and it serves as a snow fence and stops the residue movement off the field. Number three, eventually, uh, or evenly rather, distributing or concentrating residue. Now that sounds like a contradiction, right? Well, actually you can adjust your curse buster so that if you have concentrations of corn stover over the row, like you would get in any kind of 30 inch or twin row, and you want to be able to plant between those corn rows and not have to struggle with a lot of residue on your 300 bushel corn, you can actually adjust it to leave those residues concentrated right where the combine left them. You can also adjust the system so that you can spread those residues very uniformly across the entire soil and across the whole surface. So you can manage that residue any way you would like. And number four. It is, this is very, very important, it leaves root systems where they grew. And those root systems are really, really critical because they represent the primary source of carbon for microbes. They decompose very quickly under the influence of the microbes that lived in them and on them while the plant was growing. And um, these old root systems uh, do represent some new pathways, but the actual fracture forces create new and alternative pathways for replacement roots. And that's extremely important because scientists are now finding out that these root system decay locations are actually also potential vested, potential hotbeds for pathogens. And so avoiding those pathways is actually proving to be very important. And the action of the fracturing forces of the tines in this form of tillage actually provide those alternatives. La, next, uh, removing weeds and undesirable species. Um, very interesting exchange recently about that on some really tough uh, biennials and perennials that invade no-till fields. Many of those plants, uh, among those would be uh, things like quackgrass um, and thistles. Uh, if you remove compacting forces and uh, periodic anaerobic soil conditions, these species become very much uncompetitive with the plants we want to grow. And of course, uh, the seed bed that's left behind the operation of this ought to be planter friendly or cedar friendly, and it is. It essentially leaves a conventional seed bed with a lot of residue. It should help to move water and thereby reduce nutrient stratification. It should incorporate and be able to broadcast with broadcast seeds or manures, liming materials, fertilizers, and keep it uniform and just get it off of the surface and into the active biological zone in the top inch or two of your field.
should be able to maintain and enhance the microbiome health and performance of your soil through diversity and increasing microbial density. These are important because they lead to systemically acquired resistance, which equals plant health. Really, the plant does have certain capabilities to defend itself, but it's mostly in association with soil microbial populations that this plant is able actually to develop immunity to pathogens. Now, lastly, or toward the end here, beneficial fungal communities are really the direction we want to head. They gather water, they gather nutrition, they digest all kinds of obnoxious uh, chemical residues and other things that we've deposited in our soils. And, and if, we in, if we encourage sudden fluxes of oxygen and nitrogen in our soil through secondary tillage practices and primary pack practices, we will not develop those fungal communities. And they are extremely, extremely important. We want to continue to maintain uh, and re-inhabit our soils and our farms with beneficial foraging insects. And we know we've got to have food for them and we've got to have shelter that doesn't get flooded on a every time it rains. So we've got to be able to manage air and water. And of course those critters are the ones that enhance the value of our crop residues as they eat them and as they pass out of existence and as they pass waste materials onto the surface of our fields. All right, so in review, uh, just, uh, trying to sum this up, um, pulling back and looking at the soil system itself, Soils at rest now, we, we begin to understand, don't stay the same. And in fact, uh, uh, Barry Fisher in Indiana has talked about vertical erosion. Even though you may not see soil moving off the top of your field, he's now beginning to talk about this internal movement of silt particles. And I am absolutely delighted to hear that. Um, as this happens, however, the, the soils become less uh, capable and their ability uh, their ability is reduced to transport water and change air. Um, uh, every time it rains, we move more silt. And every time that silt lodges, it plugs more macropores, and therefore we reduce our ability to exchange water and air going forward. These anaerobic soil conditions which result are increasing the... Um, pathogenicity of soils and reducing the bioavailability of plant nutrients. Uh, root systems that develop become much more limiting because of the secondary metabolites. It's for example, the ethylene that we talked about and how it changed the very nature and makeup of these plant root systems. Um, the essential uh, of tillage is basically the ability of the procedure to restore water movement and to optimize it for any given soil type. Uh, water movement in soil is what is in part responsible for the soil's air changes, or in other words, soil breathing or gas exchange. What we've done in terms of secondary and primary tillage practices basically has been unnecessary. What we have done is essentially redistribute this silt so that the soil again begins to transport and exchange air properly. What we have hopefully learned here today is that it's not necessary to do that in order to reestablish good air and water movement in that soil. So we now, I think, I'm hoping, have I've gathered the fact that it is not necessary uh, to kill in order to uh, by tilling, in fact, it's net, it, we can res, we can be restoring our soils and our ability to breathe without destroying them. And my ultimate goal in getting people engaged in this is essentially an upward and outward spiral, where plants who are primarily uh, sugar producers to supply uh, to microbes colonizing hopefully large root masses uh, to feed more microbes who will go out and find more raw materials to build more sugars and more health and more tissue on these plants, which will in turn you know, support the growth of more root masses, feeding more microbes, finding more nutrition, etc. And you have this beautifully upward spiraling, ever increasing dimension of health taking place in soil. 
I really believe that God does have a blessing stored up in the earth. The psalmist said and, and wrote that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And I think we have only begun to taste the fullness thereof. We know that in proper aerobic conditions, pathogens die. We know that there are beneficial organisms, including funguses and foraging insects, that return to our fields. We also have seen these pests leave the fields under the influence of healthy plants. We know that these soils, because we can now measure them, are producing humic compounds, which are essential to plant health and to uh, nutrient retention. We know that we're actually making soil faster, topsoil, faster than it's being washed away or depleted. We've uh, now uh, observed that the streams in the groundwater are staying cleaner. We've watched nitrogen behavior in soils, and it's fantastic to watch how the nitrogen begins to accumulate in the top of our fields. Natural fertility, because of the restoration of the microbiome, is released to create nutrient-dense diets for plants and animals and people. I wanted to uh, insert this uh, invitation to everyone watching this to go to SoilCurseBuster.com where you can view free of charge the uh, webinar that was presented for three days in January of 2016. Uh, you can click on the various links there. Uh, Dr. Mary Lucero has been uh, instrumental in helping put this up for the world to uh, benefit from. I hope you'll go there. I hope you'll spend uh, hours there viewing and listening to approximately 30 hours of incredibly excellent material by some of the world's experts on um, soils and health and GMOs and all the contemporary current issues of the day. I want to say uh, uh, hello to everyone uh, from my family that's uh, living in China right now. And we want to just uh, say we're glad you, you were able to join us. We thank you for for being with us for this presentation. And we hope that um, if we can be of any further assistance to you, that you'll avail yourself of our um, SoilCurseBuster.com website or our Skype phone number, which works from anywhere, anytime, on any phone. And of course, our email addresses for yours truly and for my son, Daniel, if you need to talk to us. And uh, with that, I pronounce a blessing over you, and I thank you for your your time and investment in viewing this, which went on much longer than expected, but <clears throat> you're not surprised, I'm sure. Thanks very much for, for joining me. I, uh, I look forward to hearing from you and seeing many of you in the future. Um, we'll be, uh, I hope you enjoyed the, the live segments from the field day. I trust they've all made it in here. Dan's going to be putting this together in my absence while I'm uh, across the pond in Canada for a couple of weeks. Thanks again, everybody, and God bless you all.